Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us this evening. My name is Eric Cohen. I'm the chapter leader of the Chicago chapter of America's Future. And we're very thrilled for you to be joining us this evening. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, America's Future, we are a premier network for uh, young liberty-minded individuals. Uh, if you want to learn more about America's Future, please check us out at americasfuture.org. I'll talk to you a little bit more about uh, membership in America's Future at the end of our conversation this evening, but without any further delay. And first, we want to thank uh, Can TV, who will be re-airing uh, this conversation later on uh, television here in the city of Chicago. We're very excited for more people to be able to access it there and to learn more not only about America's Future, uh, but about our speaker this evening and what he is working on and about public education and education generally in the city of Chicago. So then without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest this evening, uh, Corey DeAngelis, who is the Director of School Choice at the Reason Foundation. He's also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. His research primarily focuses on the effects of school choice programs on non-academic outcomes such as criminal activity, charter, uh, character skills, mental health, political participation, and schooling supply. He's authored over 40 journal articles, book chapters, and reports on education policy. His research has been published in peer-reviewed academic journals such as Social Science Quarterly, School Effectiveness and School Improvement, Educational Review, Educational Research and Evaluation, Journal of School Choice, and the Cato Journal. Uh, he has also been featured at outlets such as USA Today, The New York Post, The Hill, Washington Examiner, Foundation for Economic Education, EdChoice, and Education Next. He received his PhD in education policy from the University of Arkansas. He holds a bachelor's in business administration and a master's of arts and economics from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Corey, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We really appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, first of all, I want to recommend to people, if you're on Twitter, why? But if you are on Twitter, definitely follow Corey to keep up to date with all that is going on with education, um, not only here in the city of Chicago, but across the country. And it, it, Corey, it's a really interesting time, I think, for these kinds of educations about uh, conversations about education policy, because there's so much that I think has been brought to the fore by the pandemic that were things that were bubbling under the surface that uh, would arise in different places. I think we've been largely lagging here in the city of Chicago on a lot of those conversations. But I have, um, I have for quite a while now, when I talk about this issue, I've been told I'm wrong about education in Chicago for all kinds of reasons. But the one thing I've never been told by anyone is, Cone, you're wrong. It's a system that is educating kids. <laughs> and I think more people are realizing the problems in the system. So I'm curious if you could give us your thoughts on what's going on here in Chicago, because I know you're following it, but how do we compare to what's going on with major public education systems all across the country in the, the midst of this pandemic? Yeah, the way that I'll put it is that COVID-19 didn't break the public school system. It was already broken. Uh, the pandemic simply shined a spotlight on the massive power imbalance between the public school monopoly and individual families all across the nation, including in Chicago. You know, it's one thing for your education system to fail to adequately meet the needs of individual families year after year and still retain children's education dollars, regardless of how well they do and how well the families are actually satisfied with that service. But it's another conversation altogether for the schools to fail to reopen their doors for business, and yet they continue to, to, to receive the children's education dollars uh, essentially in perpetuity. I mean, we saw all across the nation and in Chicago in particular that the private schools were open for a long time or they had been fighting to reopen throughout the entire process. Whereas so many of the teachers unions and Chicago teachers unions being one of the biggest ones that people talk about all across the country had been fighting for the opposite throughout the entire time. They've been fighting to keep their doors closed. And that doesn't mean that the people in the union have ill intentions or that they are less um, qualified than people in the private sector. It has nothing to do with that. The main difference is one of incentives, that one of the sectors gets your money regardless of whether they open their doors for business. So from a rational cost-benefit decision-making standpoint, at least in the short run, it makes sense to keep the doors closed for business if you can minimize any risk whatsoever associated with going back to in-person instruction. 
but then keep your benefits in terms of job security and pay around the same. Uh, uh, so because of that messed up set of incentives that's baked into the public school system, I think that's why we saw the stark contrast between the private sector and the public sector. And the only way that we're ever going to fix that set of incentives that's ingrained in the public school system is to fund the students directly, what some people refer to as school choice, allow the education dollars to follow the child to wherever they're getting an education so that the public and private schools would have aligned incentives with the, uh, the needs of the individual families. So if, if the public school is still working for an individual family, that option would still be on the table because the family would still be able to take their education dollars to the public school. But if not, for whatever reason, whether it's because of remote learning versus in-person instruction, or whether it's based on the academic quality in a particular school or the bullying that's going on in a particular school or uh, any other types of issues that may be going on, the, the funding could follow the child to a, a different institution. And I always like to point out that we already do this when it comes to so many other taxpayer funded initiatives even when we're talking about education, when, when we're talking about things like the Pell Grant for low-income students and the GI Bill for veterans with higher education, we don't tell people that if you want to take advantage of that funding, that you have to use it at a residentially assigned government-run university. Now, instead, the money goes to the student, and you can take the money to the public provider or the community college if you'd like, but you could also take it to a private religious or non-religious university if you'd like as well. The funding follows the student. Same thing with uh, pre-K programs. With pre-K programs, the money doesn't go to a residentially assigned government uh, institution. Instead, the money goes to the family and you can pick the public provider again, but you could also pick a private religious or non-religious provider of pre-K services when you're thinking about things like the Head Start program and other taxpayer funded state level pre-K programs. And what's interesting to me is that a lot of the same people that support funding students directly when it comes to pre-K and higher education, they get all up in arms in the in-between years when we're talking about K-12 education. And it, I started thinking about it for a while as to why there would be that disconnect. And it didn't really take all that long. And a lot of people on the uh, in the participant uh, in the in the in the chat probably understand what's going on here pretty quickly, but the main difference here again is one of incentives. That the norm when it comes to higher education and pre-K is we already have a high degree of choice, but the but choice threatens an entrenched special interest that profits from getting your children's education dollars regardless of how well they do, and this year in particular regardless of whether they even open their doors for business only when it comes to K through 12 education. So the power dynamics differ. And that's why you see some people supporting funding people and individuals when it comes to all these other industries and levels of education, but not when it comes to the in-between years of K through 12 education. Um, and I'll just continue the analogy. You think about things like food stamps. Food stamps go to people and people can choose the provider of grocery services. You can take the money to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or Walmart, and you taking the money to Whole Foods does not steal money from Walmart. And everybody understands that because the money doesn't belong to Walmart. The money belongs to the individual families. And what I argue is that the money belongs to individual families and their children when it comes to K-12 education as well, just as it does with higher education and pre-K services and uh, food stamp funding. And we can continue the analogy further with other taxpayer funded initiatives like Medicaid. Medicaid dollars can be used at public hospitals, but they can also be used at Catholic hospitals if you'd like. They can be private providers of the service, Section 8 housing vouchers the same way. All these other initiatives, the money goes to people rather than the system. And that's all I'm arguing that we should do with K-12 education. Corey, what I find uh wonderful about talking to you is how solutions focused you uh, you are on this problem. Um, let's let's talk a little bit of the nature of the problem first and then I want to pick your brain more on the solutions that you just proposed there. So why has it in your opinion been so difficult to get schools, public schools in cities like Chicago back open for in-person learning again? Um, so you have CDC guidance that has said that uh, more or less schools should be open. There seems to be, if we, we hear all the time, we should be following the science. 
And what I've been able to glean as a consumer of this information, that the science is telling us that schools are one of the places on, on one hand, that it is safe to be open, that the transmission rates there are incredibly low, that we can do this well and responsibly. My kids go to Catholic school here in Chicago. They have done in-person learning since the beginning of the school year. They've done it well, they've done it safely. Um, but then on the, uh, I think there's a, another side to it as well. Um, I may have lost my train of thought where I was going with that, but what, I'll yeah. just throw it then uh, open to you. Like, why has it been so difficult to get schools? Uh, oh, I remember the point I was going to make that it, yeah. the, the other part of the science is that the impact on students from doing their education, the way that we're holding a conversation this evening is deleterious to them. They're not advancing as fast as they otherwise would be with yeah. in-person learning. So we have science that seems to be weighing down both sides saying open the schools. And yet here in Chicago, it's still at earliest next week before we're going to have really any meaningful in-person learning. It's all about incentives. Look, I don't like to question people's motives, but it, but look, you get the same pay and, and job security and you can, you can work from home and, and, with that set of cost benefit decision making standpoint in front of you, if you can get the same benefits in terms of job security and pay and minimize any small risk whatsoever of, of contracting the virus of in-person instruction, and then also minimize the job responsibilities of, of the childcare activities and commute times and other benefits of, of working from home, then uh, the, the, the uh, incentive for you is to keep the doors closed. And that doesn't mean that the people are bad. I think a lot of people would do the same thing given that set of incentives that's ingrained in the public school system. Just imagine if your nearest grocery store got your grocery dollars, regardless of whether they open their doors for business. They, we'd probably see a lot more grocery stores fighting to remain closed. We'd probably see grocery store laborers part pouring into to the streets to try to keep their doors closed. They, could, they would probably make a lot of the same arguments that you're seeing the teachers unions making uh, every step of the way, but they didn't do that. Private schools didn't do that. Private schools took the, took the fight to the courts. In one, in one case, in Kentucky in particular, they took the fight all the way to the Supreme Court for the right to open their doors for business to, serve, to meet the needs of their customers. But we didn't see that action from the public school sector in so many places and again, it's because they get your money regardless of whether they open their doors for business. And I wanna echo your point that the science does say that the, the schools are not major contributors of community transmission and schools are some of the safest places in the community when we're talking about, when, when we're comparing them to other uh, services and locations in the community. For example, CDC researchers recently reported in JAMA, uh, a, high, a high quality journal that quote, there is very little transmission happening in the schools. They continued by saying, quote, there has been little evidence that schools have contributed, contributed meaningfully to increased community transmission. I mean, just look at New York City, for example, their latest community-wide positivity rate was about eight or 9% a test positivity rate. But for the latest testing in the schools, the positivity rate was only about 0.5%, about a 20th of the overall community positivity rate. Uh, we also have Brown University researcher, uh, economist named Dr. Emily Oster has been researching this for months, similarly writing that schools aren't uh, super spreaders and that uh, the schools can safely reopen. You have the United Nations, you have, you have UNICEF uh, wrote a report saying that uh, the, there is no consistent link after looking data uh, across 191 different countries, no consistent link between reopening schools and community transmission. You have data from uh, the United States uh, nationwide put together by Tulane University researchers showing that uh, they found no evidence to suggest that reopening schools was associated with increased community transmission or community uh, uh, COVID hospitalizations. So the science is on the side of reopening. And, and you also pointed out that it's true that there are, there's real harm happening from keeping doors closed for in-person instruction. And to be clear here, this is disproportionately having a negative effect on the least advantage in society because the most advantage that their public schools aren't open for in-person instruction, the most advantage are, are able to get over that uh, uh, 
that problem because one, they might have more access to technology to make the, the virtual instruction better. Two, they may be more likely to have the resources to be able to afford in-person instruction at private schools. Um, you have a lot of the people who, who support keeping the schools closed and who, who don't support school choice who send their own kids uh, to private schools for in-person instruction. We've seen that hypocrisy across the United States. So keeping the schools closed is really a conversation about what kind of options should the least advantaged have? Because the most advantaged are always going to have the option of in-person instruction because they can afford to pay for private school tuition and fees out of pocket. But nationwide, a study by McKinsey, McKinsey and Company reported recently that students across the nation are estimated to have lost about one to three months of learning from school closures. Uh, there's also been research cited in Wall Street Journal, for example, that students are, are, are uh, uh, losing ground physically too from increased obesity rates for the students. Uh, we're also seeing problems with mental health. So it's not just academic issues. I mean, in, in Clark County, Nevada, they recently reported, actually the New York Times reported on this, that the percentage, the number of kids committing suicide uh, for, of students has, incre has, has doubled since, since last year, uh, since the school closures. So there's a lot of costs to keeping the schools closed, primarily falling on the least advantaged in society and the benefits in terms of reducing risk aren't really there if you look at the evidence. And even if you look at statements from people like Dr. Anthony Fauci saying that we should close the bars and open the schools because the schools are some of the safest places. See, Fauci similarly said on TV that, uh, the, that, that, that they're not really seeing much spread at all between, from children and among children of the virus. And look, I don't want to force schools to do one thing or the other. I don't want to be the one to say that you have to, like every single school district has to open or every single school district has to provide this or that or the other. I think the best way to do this, to solve this problem is to allow for local control. And the only way that you're going to do that is one, allow every school district to make the decision to reopen or not. Allow every single teacher to have the option of returning to work in person or not. But you need to extend that logic downward and allow every single family to have the choice of in-person instruction or not. And the best way to do that is to allow the family to take a portion of their children's education dollars to the provider that works best for them. And that could be the public school, uh, but it might be a private school that's more than happy to open their doors for in-person instruction. And who knows, if you start doing that, allowing the money to follow the child, you might just see that the public schools will be a lot more likely to open their doors for business for in-person instruction. There's one study that has found this relationship, uh, actually, by a, it's a Brown University working paper by Michael Hartney, published in um, a few months ago. And he found, him and his co-author found that places with more low cost Catholic schools in the area, the public schools are more likely to reopen. And four studies have found that places where, with more teachers unions or more powerful teachers unions in the area after controlling for a ton of different background characteristics of the community, even after controlling for COVID risk, uh, the places with stronger teachers unions were much less likely to reopen for in-person instruction. There's four studies on that. I did one of them with uh, Christos Macritus, um, published in Social Science Research Network. So you, you've given some of the reasons that we hear for why uh, the, 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 in most cases, the teachers unions that wanna keep the schools closed are saying that they need to keep the schools closed. You, we hear a lot of reasoning having to do with health and safety. You covered some of the health and safety uh, examples there. There are others such as, you know, people who live with people who would be higher risk. So even if they do get infected, they share risk with somebody else. And it strikes me those are the kind of things you can mitigate uh, for in policy, dealing with those individual people. We've got a lot more than that in terms of explanations, particularly here in Chicago. I'm recalling specifically uh, back in December, the Chicago Teachers Union, um, if you're not following, uh, if you're following Corey on Twitter, follow the Chicago Teachers Union on Twitter as well, just for the interest. Mm. Uh, but they treated out that the effort to reopen schools was, quote, rooted in sexism, racism, and misogyny. They deleted is it. Is this, 
And and then yes, yeah, subsequently deleted the tweet after the backlash that they got. Is this? Do you think this just speaks to really what we're talking about is politics here? That it is about the entrenched political interests of the teachers union in why they are acting in the way that they're acting, as you've talked yeah. about incentives, responding to the incentives that exist for them. Yeah, this is about incentives and it is about politics and power, not so much about safety. And in the, in the study that I did and also the Brown University study, we found no relationship or very little relationship between the COVID risk in the area and the likelihood of reopening, but we found a strong relationship between the political persuasions of people living in the area and also a separate and strong relationship between the strength of the teachers unions in the area and the reopening decision. So it is more about politics and power than safety. If you look at the evidence on how sa schools can safely reopen, but then if you just look at like all of these weird things that have happened in the last year, so you don't even really have to look at the evidence. I mean, you can look at the, the tweets from the Chicago teachers unions. You can look at the hypocrisy from the uh, higher ups in the Chicago Teachers Union, for example, one of the board members of the Chicago Teachers Union was caught vacationing in Puerto Rico while tweeting ab about resisting reopening schools for in-person instruction and going back to work in person, which begs the question, why is it safe for someone to vacation and travel in person, but for that same person to not why would it not be safe for the same person to return to work for in-person instruction? And there was a lot of pushback on that because it's obvious hypocrisy and people seeing this double standard where it's okay to do things that you like, but not okay to do this other thing that, that is, happens to be work that you, you continue to get paid for regardless of whether you show up. And again, it's not because these people are have ill intentions. It's just almost anyone would do the same thing if they had their if they were in their shoes and the best and so the only way you're going to change that is to change the system instead of and we shouldn't really focus on the intentions of the individuals and the motivations of the individuals but other things that happen I'm, I'm, this was in the chicago area too you had this all across the nation where this weird phenomena of public schools not reopening for in-person learning because it wasn't they said it wasn't safe enough but then in the very next breath we're reopening the same schools for in-person childcare services. And they were charging families out of pocket in addition to what they were paying to the property tax system, hundreds of dollars per child per week. Again, who's gonna be the most likely to be able to afford those in-person privileges? It's gonna be the most advantaged in society. And so again, we're seeing how keeping the schools closed is leading to inequities academically, mentally, physically, um, and, and the best way to fix that, to lead to more equity is one, you could just open the schools and give every family a choice, but then two, fund the students directly so more families can have access to alternatives to the traditional system. I mean, you saw a lot of these ridiculous things. You saw the Chicago teachers unions, if you want to follow them on Twitter, and they did delete the tweet where they tried to say that reopening schools was re rooted in racism, but they also... Uh, created a, a, a video of an interpretive dance to protest reopening the schools in person. And they got ratioed for that tweet because it was just a little ridiculous, you know, that, that they had all this time to do this, you know, get the dance teachers together to create a video to protest reopening schools. You got to watch it to know what I'm talking about. I recommend everybody go check it out because it is, it's something it, else. It is something else. And, you know, that that's just the start of it. There's there's a whole bunch of other things that that happened in the past year from the daycare centers to the to the tweets um, to the hypocrisy. And I think, you know, families are seeing all this nonsense. And in a sense, I did say that from a cost benefit decision making standpoint, it, it might have made sense for the teachers unions to do this in the short run. But in the long run, I think they've overplayed their hand because there's a, a huge shift in the hearts and minds of people in looking at how we fund K-12 education. Families have been getting a bad deal for a long time, and they're figuring it out this year because they're seeing that these closed buildings are getting their children's education dollars regardless of whether they open their doors and regardless of how well they do. 
and they're scrambling. Families have been families have been suffering this whole time trying to figure out what to do for their children's education. And even when the school district would say that the school was going to open on a particular date and that and the families were ready to send their kids back, the, the, the teachers union would fight with the district and they'd kick the can down the road a little further and move the goalpost. And then families would be stuck scrambling again at the 11th hour. And so families are looking at the situation and seeing that they're getting the short end of the stick. And I think that they're seeing that there's no good reason to fund these closed institutions when you can fund the students directly instead. And there are actually two nationwide surveys that have recently been conducted uh, by, by a couple of polling uh, firms finding that support for school choice has surged recently. For example, the latest Real Clear Opinion research polling on this nationwide has found that support for school choice initiatives, or what I call funding students directly, has increased by 10 percentage points uh, in just a short amount of time between April 2020 and August 2020 among families who had their kids in the public school system. So it makes sense when you look at this demographic in particular for them to realize that you know the school system wasn't there for them in this past year. Another poll by Morning Consult found that there, the support for every type of school choice that they asked about, uh, private school vouchers, education savings accounts, tax credit scholarships, charter schools, there was a surge in support for all of these types of school choice since last year and between the spring and fall of 2020. And the most recent data found that 86% of parents with school-aged children support education savings accounts, which is the, the best idea, the best way to implement funding students as opposed to systems where the money that would have went to your public school a portion of that would follow the child into something called an education savings account, which you could then use that money for private school tuition and fees if you'd like, but you could also customize and use that money for non-private school expenditures that are education related, such as micro-schooling or pandemic pods. And we saw a lot of this in the last year where when the school, the government run schools weren't opening for in-person instruction, a lot of families we're seeking out pandemic pods where you get five to 10 children together in a household to kind of economize on the process of homeschooling to make it more economically feasible. And so you could use these education savings accounts to pay for some of these types of things and including other types of home-based education, vocational education, uh, and other any other government approved education expenditures. And in fact, this momentum has been followed by real action in the states where it matters the most. 92% of education funding is at the, comes from the state and local level. So despite the fact that the new administration, the Biden administration, tends to be not very friendly to school choice initiatives, I'm optimistic that school choice will continue to expand going forward because of this change in the hearts and minds of families and because we've seen now, as of today, a majority of states have introduced legislation to fund students as opposed to institution, institutions, mostly in the form of education savings accounts. And two of those bills happen to be in Illinois. Two uh, Republican legislators have introduced bills to fund students directly. One, one of them is if your school doesn't reopen for in-person instruction. And then the other one is just regardless of the reopening decision. You know, it, it, in fact, I would say that 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 should be how this works, that you, you, you're able to take your children's education dollars to the provider of your choosing, regardless of the reopening decision, because look, the education funding is supposed to be meant for educating children. It's not supposed to be meant for propping up and protecting a particular institution. If uh, anyone has questions for Corey, I encourage you to drop them in the Q&A function or into the chat, and we will get to those very shortly here. Um, to add to what you were saying, Corey, the one of the other circumstances I remember hearing, I don't know if this was just proposed by the Chicago Teachers Union or one of the things that's actually happening is that they wouldn't have teachers in there for in-person instruction. But what they were going to do was they were they were proposing to hire non-union proctors to come in and proctor the children while the teachers teach over a Zoom connection or some kind of a video connection, um, which seems 
somewhat baffling if the whole point is about uh, communication, communicativeness of the disease or safety. Well, then it would theoretically affect the non-union people. They'd be hiring the proctor <laughs> just as much as it would affect the union teachers. And yet there doesn't seem to be the same amount of concern for those people. Yeah. And, and that's the problem here. That's why families, uh, you know, it's good for the private sector employees that got to gain additional funding out of pocket from the families. And that's great for the public school employees, too, because they were able to stay home and teach from home. Uh, and provide remote instruction. But the people that are getting left out of all these conversations and all these fights between the district and the teachers unions are the individual families. The whole point of the education system is supposed to be to serve and educate children and their families, not the other way around. And I think this year in particular is pointing out what what we've all known, for, what a lot of us have known for for a long time, that there's a massive power imbalance between the providers of education, the public school monopoly, and the consumers of educational services, the individual children and their families. And this has been made clearer now than ever. And uh, another reason why I think this is a lot more to do with po power and politics than safety is when you look at a lot of the demands that started to come out from Los Angeles Teachers Union was one of the first one that made these demands, but then the Chicago Teachers Union also band, had band together on two occasions with about two dozen other teachers unions and also the Democratic Socialists of America in their fight to, to quote unquote, demand safe schools. They called for two separate uh, national days of resistance where the first one they poured out into the streets and, and protested with, you know, uh, fake body bags and tombstones and um, other uh, uh, types of, of props uh, to, to try to say that, you, you know, you're, you're pretty much, you know, they're saying that you're they gonna were just, you're, you're, you're going to kill us yeah. if, if you reopen the schools was, was pretty much the mes message. The second time, I think they did it more virtually or in cars and in caravans after the pushback they received from the initial day of resistance. But what was really interesting here was that they called for what we expected, right? They called for a lot more money and more staffing. Uh, but then they also put in all these political demands as well. They called for a ban on their competition. They called for a ban on new charter schools and private school choice programs. And if it was about safety, wouldn't you be for allowing families to spread out to other in-person uh, uh uh, providers of the services, if it was about safety and you cared about social distancing, you want to try to trap people in your institutions instead of allowing them to spread out. But then they also called for things like police-free schools or defunding the police. They called for Medicare for all in Los Angeles. They called for, in, in this National Day of Resistance, they called to ban standardized testing. And I don't even, I'm not even a fan of standardized testing. I think that uh, we do too much teaching to the test, and I think uh, there's a lot more value to, to schooling and education than what can be measured by a test score. But for them to lump that together in their demands for safely reopening, it seemed to me more like a power play. And then they also called for other things like that were completely unrelated, such as cancellation of rents and, and, and foreclosures and uh, other types of economic types of uh, non-education related demands. Corey, what would you say to the argument against the reform proposals that you have highlighted that says what you will be accomplishing through that is um, the defunding of public schools by taking that money and sending it off to private schools and to Catholic schools, to religious schools. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to then starve the public schools that people, um, particularly those of lesser means, rely on in order to make sure that their kids get an education. Uh, what do you say in uh, in response to that argument? School, cho school choice doesn't defund public schools. If anything, public schools absent a school choice program defund families. 
You would similarly never hear school choice initiatives just return that money to the hands of the rightful owners, which is the families and their children. And they could take it to the public schools if they'd like, if that's the best option that, for them. But the money doesn't belong to any institution, public or private. The money is meant for educating children. It should follow them to wherever they're getting an education. Just think of it this way. You would never hear someone say that allowing families to, to choose their grocery store defunds Walmart. You would never hear that, and everybody would think it would be absolutely ridiculous for anyone to say that because everyone understands that your grocery dollars don't belong to Walmart. They don't belong to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's either. So choosing one over the other doesn't defund one or the other because it doesn't belong to any of these institutions. Similarly, K-12 education funding belongs to the kids, to the kids and their families, not the government monopoly provider of educational services. Similarly, Pell Grants don't defund community colleges just because you can use them at private providers of higher education. Head Start programs don't defund public providers of pre-K services just because you can use them at private providers, and no one makes those arguments. Uh, and again, it's because the power dynamics differ. The, the, the reason is with K-12 education, there is a special interest that gets your money regardless of your choice, but you don't have that power dynamic playing out when it comes to pre-K and higher education and things like grocery stores with, with the analogy that I used there. Uh, and what's also interesting, I have two more responses to this because this is such a bad uh, argument from the other side. The, the second response to this argument is that this is essentially an admission from the defenders of the status quo that they believe that families will choose something else when given the option. So why, why would giving families a choice defund the public schools if the public schools are doing a good job? Because a lot of the people on the other side of this will try to say, our public schools are great, we don't need choice. But then on the, on, in, in the next breath, they'll say that school choice defunds the public schools. Well, which one is it? Uh, if you're doing a good job, people will continue to take their money to your institution. And then third, I pointed out earlier, things like education savings accounts are funded at about a, a portion of what you would have gotten in the public schools. So a lot of the times it's only about half. And then also public schools are funded based on enrollment counts, but they're not totally funded based on enrollment counts. Um, no state that I've seen are, is 100% of funding based on the amount of students you have in the school. So what that means mathematically, when you lose a student to a school choice program or whether a family leaves to pay out of pocket for private school tuition, the financial impact is the same. But the reality is the public schools get to keep a lot of the funding for students who, no, who are no longer there because they're only partially funded based on enrollment counts. So mathematically, they end up with more money per child left behind in the public school system which doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it in terms of like private schools, for example. A private school doesn't get to keep your tuition payments or even a fraction of your tuition payments after you leave to another institution. They'd be happy if they were able to, and I'd argue that public schools should be happy they get to keep some of the money for children they're no longer educating as well. Walmart doesn't get to keep a fraction of your grocery funding, let's say 20% of your grocery funding, even after you start shopping at Trader Joe's, that would be ridiculous, and Walmart would be happy about that setup. That would be a good deal. And the public schools are similarly getting a great deal, even when you have a school choice program in place, because they get to keep so much of the funding for students who are no longer there. The public school defenders will respond by saying, well, we have fixed costs. We have to keep the lights on. But the reality is every single business in existence has fixed costs and all costs are variable in the long run. And just because you have fixed costs doesn't mean that that institution gets to keep your money after you leave, uh, despite them not providing you with services. So a private school doesn't get to keep demanding money from you after you leave. A charter school doesn't get to get, continue doing that. A a grocery store doesn't get to continue getting more and more of your food stamps, for example, after you leave and start shopping at another institution. And they'd be happy if they did. The public schools should be happy as well. And look, uh, another part of your question hinted at inequities from the least advantage being kind of quote unquote stuck in the public schools. But the reality is advantaged families already have school choice. They can already afford to live in the neighborhoods that happen to be residentially assigned to the best public schools. They can already afford to pay out of pocket for private school tuition and fees. They can already afford to pay for the costs associated with home-based education. 
So funding students directly leads to more equity by allowing more families to access alternatives. And then also the students who are who remain in the public schools, they don't just have a higher amount of per pupil expenditures that can be allocated towards them. The other response I have is that competitive pressures lead to better outcomes in the public schools too. There are 28 studies on this topic that look at the effects of private school choice competition on the children who remain in the public school system. 26 of these 28 studies find statistically significant positive effects of private school choice competition on the students who remain in the public school system. So in this sense, school choice is a rising tide that lifts all boats and you don't even really have to use the programs to benefit from them because of these competitive pressures. And I'll give you one more set of studies uh, uh, in just a second. There are five studies that I know of on this topic that similarly find that school choice competition leads to higher salaries for the teachers in the public school system. And that is because of the competitive pressures, again, that the public schools start to scratch their heads a little bit and think, well, if I don't want to lose any of the funding associated with those children, maybe I should allocate my resources more efficiently. And so what they start to do is allocate more of the resources towards the children in the classroom instead of allocating that funding towards things like administrative bloat and surges in support staff. Uh, so we, we tend to see that the public school teachers actually benefit as well from higher salaries. I mean, just think about it nationwide, and this happens state by state as well. But between 1992 and 2014, the per pupil education expenditures in the U.S. after adjusting for inflation increased by 27%. Real teacher salaries after adjusting for inflation dropped by 2%. And again, that's because we pour more and more money into, into the system. It doesn't go towards the teachers in the classroom. Instead, it, go, it goes towards putting more and more people in this into the system, which is great for the union bosses because that allows for them to have more political power in numbers, but then allows them to have more dues because they have more people in the system yeah, then you have more dues paying members. And if you were to allocate the money towards higher teacher salaries, do you want to have that same kind of benefit for the teachers union bosses? So school choice benefits families and their students and their and children. And it, it, it benefits the students in the public and the private sector, but it also benefits the teachers as well. I'm going to go to a, uh, a comment here from Adrian. We use that to ask a question. Adrian just said, thank you for this webinar. Live in the heart of the city, Chicago's third ward, where many people are asking about alternatives to public school. Corey, what I want to ask you is, you know, I, I remember hearing kind of at the onset of the, uh, the pandemic, um, as we're dealing with the schooling circumstances, you know, my kids who uh, go to Catholic school were at home doing online education, that we would see some interesting innovation coming out of this for ways that people would find their own means of dealing with circumstances that were kind of foisted upon them. What forms of innovation in education do you think we've seen as a result of these circumstances that we've been living through? So in addition to the kind of normally thought about alternatives to education that I think Adrian was hinting at that you've covered a lot, are there anything out, is there anything else out there that we've seen rise as really the result or come to fruition as a result of this pandemic that uh, people aren't paying attention to right now? Yeah, so the one thing I already talked about was people are re-envisioning how we fund education, and they're seeing that these closed buildings are getting funding, whereas the, their, their children are scrambling elsewhere, and none of that money is following them to wherever they're getting education. Mm -hmm. So we're we're, we're changing the minds of people about how we fund education. And so support for funding students directly has jumped. But then also people have started to re-envision the factory model of schooling itself. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people have had trouble with remote learning and they've had trouble with, uh, especially in, in terms of how the public school system has rolled out their v version of Zoom learning. But some families who would have otherwise not been able to get a taste of homeschooling have started to figure out that, that, that their kids are thriving in the home-based learning environment. So I think we'll see an uptick in home-based learning, whether that's through formal homeschooling or virtual charter schools going forward. And we've already seen an uptick in, in people formally enrolled as, as homeschoolers all across the nation and people enrolled in virtual charter schools, particularly because virtual charter schools had been doing this for decades, whereas the public schools uh, we're really just doing this on the fly. And so 
it, it makes sense where why so many families have switched to the virtual charter schools. But then also, right when the closures started, within a few months, uh, we saw groups online. If you look on Facebook and you look, if you just type in the words pandemic pods, there was a group that emerged in the San Francisco Bay Area that got 30 to 40,000 members in just a matter of a couple of months of families getting together, trying to form these pandemic pods, um, where it's another word for this is a micro school where five to 10 children get together in a household to economize on the cost of homeschooling. And a lot of people may really like that as opposed to the really highly rigid structured one size fits all public school system. Um, so we may see more of that going forward. We've seen um, new companies sprout up to provide micro schooling options to families. We've seen apps emerge of kind of like the Uber of education. I think that's a really innovative thing that's, that's happened recently as well. I think one of the apps is called unschool.school. If you type into your browser, unschool.school, where they're essentially doing what Airbnb did, where they, there was a lot of stagnant supply of, of either um, uh, uh, space for, for li you know, living space or uh, what have you, whatever you want to call it, and, and demand of that living space. And the apps essentially linked those two things together. Same thing with Uber. Uh, but then with, with uh, things like unschool.school, you're essentially having the Uber of education linking uh, educators with people who are demanding education, families and, and their children. So I think that's really interesting to, to watch going forward, but I'm really, really interested in seeing these bills at the state level and in 26 states now where uh, some of them have a, a really good shot in, in some states, about six of them have passed out of a chamber already and five of the states have already passed bills. Five other states have passed bills out of committees as well. So, uh, you know, 2021 could be the year of school choice because of all this. And in a way, although we're talking about a lot of the bad things that teachers have, teachers unions have done in the past year, the teachers unions might have done a lot of good in the long run in that they've essentially been providing free advertising for school choice. And one could say they've done more to advance school choice in the past year than anyone could ever imagined. Hey, Corey, if you'll indulge me a quick anecdote here, maybe about eight years ago, I was involved with a group that was working to bring a virtual charter school to the Fox River Valley area west of um, in the far west Chicago suburbs. And it was an experience. Um, it really was an experience in part because it was uh, being a virtual charter school and being kind of narrowly tailored to the kind of people who would need that kind of an experience where they're not really going to a physical building. They're doing learning from home, but within this larger structure, the application to open this charter school was to something like 29 different school districts throughout this area. And we had to hold, have public hearings with all 29 school districts. They scheduled them all over the course of three days. Mm. They were all an inquisition. Um, they were just a list of 180 some questions that they went through with everybody, representatives of the group that I was working with. Uh, one of the, and one of the collaborative partners that we had for this experience who was gonna help provide curriculum for this uh, virtual charter school. It said that they had been doing this all over the country and they had mm. never seen anything quite like the experience that we had here in Illinois. And ultimately that, um, that whole project ended in the state capitol in Springfield where they actually changed the way that they were going to grant charter schools and the way that the charter school commission in the state of Illinois worked in order to stop, not just specifically this project, but a lot of similar projects like that. Well, I mean, and this reminds me of another form of rent seeking that we saw all across the country by, uh, groups that represent teachers and teachers unions right at the start of the pandemic. Uh, when schools closed in March, 2020, just a couple of weeks later, within the same month, the Oregon Education Association lobbied to the government to make it illegal for families to switch to public charter schools that were already in existence in their state because they understood that again, 
those schools have been doing this for years and years successfully and the public schools were doing it on the fly. And they knew that when they, lo- when they would lose enrollment counts, they would lose substantial portions of funding. And so they really uh, is, came out and sh- showed their true col- colors at the start of this, you know, within weeks of, of the closures of the schools, they had already figured it out that families were switching to the charter schools and wall street journal um, reported right when this started as well in March of 2020, that I think it was about a thousand families had already been blocked from switching to virtual charters, just one virtual charter school, Oregon Connections Academy, in just a few days after the order went in place. So this was really rent seeking to protect the monopoly at the expense of thousands of families. You saw similar things, the Pennsylvania Association of School Administrators similarly lobbied to make it illegal to switch to their virtual charter schools. And they actually came out there with their president explicitly saying that they were doing this because families were seeing that the virtual charter schools were a good option and that they were scared that they were going to lose some funding associated with those children. They didn't get that. They got the next best thing in Pennsylvania. They were able to make it, it was legal to switch to the virtual charters, but they made it so that the money wouldn't follow the child to the public charter school the virtual public charter school. So it's essentially the same thing in practice. Uh, And then California did the same thing. Senate bill 98 passed, which didn't allow the funding to follow the child to the public charter schools, which uh, resulted in hundreds and hundreds of families who were already admitted to those schools being kicked off the wait list in California. And I think in response to that, there were groups of families in, in California filed a lawsuit uh, against the governor and, 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 and the government, essentially the state, for prevent, preventing their children from accessing educational options in, in this time of need. Well, Corey, we're about coming to the end of our time here. I want to uh, maybe lightning round through these last two questions that I have here. So give some uh, quick thoughts on them from Jason. Uh, I was asking about teacher credentialing. Do you have any suggestions for reform in teacher certification? Uh, Has the COVID pandemic sparked reform for teacher certification at all? Maybe open it up to people working in an outside career field, uh, like with junior college professors or instructors. Yeah, get rid of it. There's no evidence or the preponderance of the evidence doesn't suggest that teacher certification leads to better student outcomes. And so what you're, you're essentially doing with the, this regulation is creating a barrier to entry and preventing otherwise qualified people from getting into the labor force when it comes to K-12 education. So you're limiting your pool of applicants, which is a problem. Uh, I see why people do it in the public school system. It's because there isn't any meaningful form of bottom-up accountability, but for, for which, I, which I would prefer allowing families to vote with their feet. That's the truest form of accountability, the only form of real accountability that I know of. Um, but uh, look, the, even within that system, these top-down regulations haven't seemed to lead to better student outcomes. So you might as well open up the labor market and allow for you know retired professors to be able to 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 go into the public school system as as well and, and let the principals make the decision about whether that person is um, would be a good fit for their school and, and would lead to better outcomes. But you know I would ideally like to see this decertification or elimination of these requirements alongside school choice so that we can at least say, well, there's now bottom-up accountability, which is way more meaningful than this fake version of top-down accountability, uh, quote-unquote accountability, which is, we, we should just be real and call it red tape and, bureauc- and bureaucratic regulation. It's not accountability. For anyone interested in uh, that topic, as well as uh, other issues of occupational licensing, I encourage you to check out the work of uh, my friend Shoshana Weissman over at R Street Institute, who is all over the occupational licensing questions. Does fantastic work on that subject. Um, what, uh, one more quick question for you here, Corey. Uh, Act 10 in Wisconsin, as from Chris, uh, Act 10 in Wisconsin somewhat weakened the teachers unions, at least financially. Are other states taking similar measures? What other actions can be taken uh, to decrease the clout the teachers unions have over this whole process? And well, the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court case in 2018, the Janus decision, made it so that compulsory union dues are no longer 
uh, permissible. So every single public school teacher can weigh the costs and benefits of union membership and say, I don't want to, I don't want to join the, 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 the union and they can't make that a uh, condition of employment. So in a sense, all states now are currently right to work states that they, they cannot be forced to, to pay the union dues because of the Janus decision. And if there is a place doing that, they should take it up to the Supreme Court because it's under current law, not permissible to do that. Um, so that's that's one measure. And I, I know there are some organizations emailing teachers and whatnot to tell them of their, their, uh, their right to opt out of the union. But some states are uh, taking the Janus decision and saying that, well, this means that that teachers have to opt out. They're going to be de facto opted in, and if they want to get out, they need to opt out. But the Janus decision was pretty clear in saying that, um, and I talked about this quote on a recent podcast, so I should have it off the top of my head, but I don't. But uh, the the teach it's something along the lines that the teachers need to, or, or the the public sector or the employees in general have to have to affirm union membership. So that, that from, from the word affirm would, would it imply that they need to opt into the union membership. But some states, from what I can tell, and from what I've heard, are taking the Janus decision and just not listening to it and, and requiring um, teachers and, and other employees to opt out rather than opt in. Uh, so, and there's another case that just got brought up because of this in a state where that, that is making the uh, opt out required. Um, uh, other measures uh, other than that, it's, you know, the, the big thing is the, uh, the school choice initiatives, funding the student. I, look, a lot of people listen to the things I say and, the, and they think that, you know, oh, you, you, know, you, you must not, not like unions or something. And I don't really have a problem with unions. The problem that I have with the union power in general, when it comes to K to 12 public schools is that there's no accountability mechanism for the types of policies that the lot, the union lobbies for. If the union wants to lobby to keep public schools close, I would be fine with that. If every single family were able to take their children's education dollars elsewhere, because at least then if they kept the public schools closed, they'd be financially punished for doing so. If the families did in fact not want that type of instruction. And so they'd have a better incentive to push for policies that actually did, did good things for families. And similarly, you know, if, if, if like a private sector employee group, let's say Walmart employees just decide to go on strike one day, I'm, I'm cool with their, with their right to do that. That's fine. And they should be able to do that. And the reason why it's like, I'm okay with it in the private sector is because if that happens, it's kind of inconvenient for me if I want to shop at Walmart, but I could take my money to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or another provider of the service. I'm not the one feeling the pain, but when it comes to so many public sector unions, the taxpayer and the consumer of the service is the one who feels all the pain. And you saw this in Chicago, the fights going between the mayor and the district and the teachers unions, all playing tug of war with, with um, in-person instruction. Meanwhile, families are sitting over here not knowing what to do and getting left out of the conversation and really just getting the short end of the stick where, whereas you, that, and that's the main problem here. If we just fund the students instead, we wouldn't have as much of an issue with teachers unions. That's the best way to hold them accountable. I remember back to the uh, Chicago teachers union strike and I believe it was 2012. And I remember what frustrated me so incredibly about that. The conversation surrounding that is the way it was covered in the media, particularly it pitted the Chicago teachers union uh, and what they were advancing against Rahm Emanuel as the uh, mayor of Chicago and the reformer. And I'm going, neither of these people really represent the point of view that I hold in this conversation. And I don't know that they represent the actual interests of parents either. And they get left out of the conversation and what becomes just a head to head battle as so many of these things are reduced to. But thank you, Corey, so much for the attention that you're bringing to these issues and for joining us this evening. Uh, Corey DeAngelis, he is the director of School Choice at Reason Foundation and an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Corey, really grateful for you uh, spending some time with us this evening. Thank you so much for having me.